This is a special bonus podcast episode. I just finished reading Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, PhD, and found it crazy enlightening. Of course, we know sleep is important, and most of us have like a general idea about the do's and don'ts around sleep, but this book will dramatically open your eyes to the benefits of sleep and detrimental effects of a lack of sleep. So I think everyone should read this book, but since most folks won't, I wanted to highlight a few parts of this that I think are the most epidemic these days and ones that you guys, my loyal friends of Well P, would find interesting probably. So I'm going to read a little intro and then go into the effects of caffeine and alcohol on sleep and well-being and then wrap up with uh, 12 tips for healthy sleep that Walker provides the reader at the end of this book. So for some immediate sleep solution takeaways. So here we go. There does not seem to be one major organ within the body or process within the brain that isn't optimally enhanced by sleep and detrimentally impaired when we don't get enough. That we receive such a bounty of health benefits each night should not be surprising. After all, we're awake for two-thirds of our lives, and we don't just achieve one useful thing during that stretch of time. We accomplish myriad undertakings that promote our own well-being and survival. Why, then, would we expect sleep and the 25 to 30 years on average it takes from our lives to offer one function only? Through an explosion of discoveries over the past 20 years, we have come to realize that evolution did not make a spectacular blunder in conceiving of sleep. Sleep dispenses a multitude of health insuring benefits, yours to pick up and repeat prescription every 24 hours, should you choose. Within the brain, sleep enriches a diversity of functions, including our ability to learn, memorize, and make logical decisions and choices. Benevolently servicing our psychological health, Sleep recalibrates our emotional brain circuits, allowing us to navigate next day social and psychological challenges with cool-headed composure. We're even beginning to understand the most impervious and controversial of all conscious experiences, the dream. Dreaming provides a unique suite of benefits to all species fortunate enough to experience it, humans included. Among these gifts are a consoling neurochemical bath that mollifies painful memories and a virtual reality space in which the brain melds past and present knowledge, inspiring creativity. Downstairs in the body, sleep restocks the armory of our immune system, helping fight malignancy, preventing infection, and warding off all manner of sickness. Sleep reforms the body's metabolic state by fine-tuning the balance of insulin and circulating glucose. Sleep further regulates our appetite, helping control body weight through healthy food selection rather than rash impulsivity. Plentiful sleep maintains a flourishing microbiome within your gut, from which we know so much of our nutritional health begins. Adequate sleep is intimately tied to the fitness of our cardiovascular system, lowering blood pressure while keeping our hearts in fine condition. A balanced diet and exercise are of vital importance, yes, but we now see sleep as the preeminent force in this health trinity. The physical and mental impairments caused by one night of bad sleep dwarf those caused by an equivalent absence of food or exercise. It's difficult to imagine any other state, natural or medically manipulated, that affords a more powerful redressing of physical and mental health at every level of analysis. Sleep pressure and caffeine. Your 24-hour circadian rhythm is the first of the two factors determining wake and sleep. The second is sleep pressure. At this very moment, a chemical called adenosine is building up in your brain. It will continue to increase in concentration with every waking minute that elapses. The longer you're awake, the more adenosine will accumulate. Think of adenosine as a chemical barometer that continuously registers the amount of elapsed time since you woke up this morning. One consequence of increasing adenosine in the brain is an increasing desire to sleep. 
This is known as sleep pressure, and it is the second force that will determine when you feel sleepy and thus should go to bed. Using a clever dual action effect, high concentrations of adenosine simultaneously turn down the volume of wake promoting regions in the brain and turn up the dial on sleep inducing regions. As a result of that chemical sleep pressure, when adenosine concentrations peak, an irresistible urge for slumber will take hold. It happens to most people after 12 to 16 hours of being awake. You can, however, artificially mute the sleep signal of adenosine by using a chemical that makes you feel more alert and awake, caffeine. Caffeine is not a food supplement. Rather, caffeine is the most widely used and abused psychoactive stimulant in the world. It is the second most traded commodity on the planet after oil. The consumption of caffeine represents one of the longest and largest unsupervised drug studies ever conducted on the human race, perhaps rivaled only by alcohol, and it continues to this day. Caffeine works by successfully battling with adenosine for privilege of latching onto adenosine welcome sites or receptors in the brain. Once caffeine occupies these receptors, however, it does not stimulate them like adenosine, making you sleepy. Rather, caffeine blocks and effectively inactivates the receptors, acting as a masking agent. It's the equivalent of sticking your fingers in your ears to shut out a sound. By hijacking and occupying these receptors, caffeine blocks the sleepiness signal normally communicated to the brain by adenosine. The upshot, caffeine tricks you into feeling alert and awake, despite the high levels of adenosine that would otherwise seduce you into sleep. Levels of circulating caffeine peak approximately 30 minutes after consumption. What is problematic, though, is the persistence of caffeine in your system. In pharmacology, we use the term half-life when discussing a drug's efficacy. This simply refers to the length of time it takes for the body to remove 50% of a drug's concentration. Caffeine has an average half-life of five to seven hours. So let's say you have a cup of coffee after your evening dinner around 7.30. This means that by 1.30 in the morning, 50% of that caffeine may still be active and circulating throughout your brain tissue. In other words, by 1.30 in the morning, you're only halfway to completing the job of cleansing your brain of the caffeine you drink after dinner. There's nothing benign about that 50% mark either. Half a shot of caffeine is still plenty powerful and much more decomposition work lies ahead throughout the night before caffeine disappears. Sleep will not come easily or be smooth throughout the night as your brain continues its battle against the opposing force of caffeine. Most people do not realize how long it takes to overcome a single dose of caffeine and therefore fail to make the link between that bad night of sleep we wake from in the morning, and the cup of coffee we had 10 hours earlier with dinner. Caffeine, which is not only prevalent in coffee, certain teas, and many energy drinks, but also foods such as dark chocolate and ice cream, as well as drugs such as weight loss pills and pain relievers, is one of the most common culprits that keep people from falling asleep easily and sleeping soundly thereafter, typically masquerading as insomnia, which is an actual medical condition. Also be aware that decaffeinated does not mean non-caffeinated. One cup of decaf contains 15 to 30% of the dose of a regular cup of coffee, which is far from caffeine free. Should you drink three to four cups of decaf in the evening, it's just as damaging to your sleep as one regular cup of coffee. The jolt of caffeine does wear off. Caffeine is removed from your system by an enzyme within your liver which gradually degrades it over time. Based in large part on genetics, some people have a more efficient version of the enzyme that degrades caffeine, allowing the liver to rapidly clear it from the bloodstream. These rare individuals can drink an espresso with dinner and fall asleep at midnight without a problem. Others, however, have a slower acting version of the enzyme. It takes far longer for their system to eliminate the same amount of caffeine. As a result, they are very sensitive to caffeine's effects. One cup of tea or coffee in the morning will last much of the day, and should they have a second cup, 
even early in the afternoon, they'll find it difficult to fall asleep in the evening. Aging also alters the speed of caffeine clearance. The older we are, the longer it takes our brain and body to remove caffeine, and thus the more sensitive we become in later life to caffeine's sleep-disrupting influence. If you're trying to stay awake late into the night by drinking coffee, you should be prepared for a nasty consequence when your liver successfully evicts the caffeine from your system, a phenomenon commonly known as a caffeine crash. Like the batteries running down on a toy robot, your energy levels plummet rapidly. You find it difficult to function and concentrate with a strong sense of sleepiness once again. We now understand why. For the entire time that caffeine is in your system, the sleepiness chemical it blocks, adenosine, nevertheless continues to build up. Your brain is not aware of this rising tide of sleep encouraging adenosine, however, because the wall of caffeine you've created is holding it back from your perception. But once your liver dismantles that barricade of caffeine, you feel a vicious backlash. You're hit with the sleepiness you had experienced two or three hours ago before you drank that cup of coffee, plus all that extra adenosine that's accumulated in the hours in between, impatiently waiting for caffeine to leave. When the receptors become vacant by way of caffeine decomposition, adenosine rushes back in and smothers the receptors. When this happens, you are assaulted with a most forceful adenosine trigger urge to sleep, the aforementioned caffeine crash. Unless you consume even more caffeine to push back against the weight of adenosine, which would start a dependency cycle, you're going to find it very difficult to remain awake. To impress upon you the effects of caffeine, I footnote esoteric research conducted in the 80s by NASA. Their scientists exposed spiders to different drugs and then observed the webs that they constructed. Those drugs included LSD, speed, amphetamine, marijuana, and caffeine. The results, which speak for themselves, can be observed in figure three. So since you guys can't see it, basically it shows a normal web. LSD is pretty vacant looking. Marijuana is a little wonky. Speed is kind of somewhere in between. And then caffeine is super crazy looking. It does not look like a normal web at all. Way worse than speed. So the researchers noted how strikingly incapable the spiders were in constructing anything resembling a normal or even logical web that would be of any functional use when given caffeine, even relative to the other potent drugs tested. Turning down the nightcap. Alcohol. Short of prescription sleeping pills, the most misunderstood of all sleep aids is alcohol. Many individuals believe alcohol helps them to fall asleep more easily or even offer sounder sleep throughout the night. Both are untrue. Alcohol is in a class of drugs called sedatives. It binds to receptors within the brain that prevents neurons from firing their electrical impulses. Saying that alcohol is a sedative often confuses people, as alcohol in moderate doses helps individuals liven up and become more social. How can a sedative enliven you? The answer comes down to the fact that your increased sociability is caused by sedation of one part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, early in the timeline of alcohol's creeping effects. As we've discussed, this frontal lobe region of the human brain helps control our impulses and restrains our behavior. Alcohol immobilizes that part of our brain first. As a result, we loosen up, becoming less controlled and more extroverted, but anatomically targeted brain sedation, it still is. Give alcohol a little more time and it begins to sedate other parts of the brain dragging them down into a stupefied state, just like the prefrontal cortex. You begin to feel sluggish as the inebriation sets in. This is your brain slipping into sedation. Your desire and ability to remain conscious are decreasing, and you can let go of consciousness more easily. I'm very deliberately avoiding the term sleep, however, because sedation is not sleep. Alcohol sedates you out of wakefulness, but it does not induce natural sleep. The electrical brainwave state you enter via alcohol is not that of natural sleep. Rather, it's akin to a light form of anesthesia. 
Yet this is not the worst of it when considering the effects of the evening nightcap on your slumber. More than its artificial sedating influence, alcohol dismantles an individual's sleep in an additional two ways. First, alcohol fragments sleep, littering the night with brief awakenings. Alcohol-infused sleep is therefore not continuous and, as a result, not restorative. Unfortunately, most of these nighttime awakenings go unnoticed by the sleeper since they don't remember them. Individuals, therefore, fail to link consumption of alcohol the night before with feelings of next-day exhaustion caused by the undetected sleep disruption sandwiched in between. Second, alcohol is one of the most powerful suppressors of REM sleep that we know of. When the body metabolizes alcohol, it produces byproduct chemicals called aldehydes and ketones. The aldehydes in particular will block the brain's ability to generate REM sleep. It's rather like the cerebral version of cardiac arrest, preventing the pulsating beat of brain waves that otherwise power dream sleep. People consuming even moderate amounts of alcohol in the afternoon or evening are thus depriving themselves of dream sleep. There is a sad and extreme demonstration of this fact observed in alcoholics who, when drinking, can show little in the way of any identifiable REM sleep. Going for such long stretches of time without dream sleep produces a tremendous buildup in and backlog of pressure to obtain REM sleep, so great in fact that it inflicts a frightening consequence upon these individuals, aggressive intrusions of dreaming while they are wide awake. The pent-up REM sleep pressure erupts forcefully into waking consciousness, causing hallucinations, delusions, and disorientation. The technical term for this terrifying psychotic state is delirium trem tremens. Sorry, guys, I don't know. Should the addict enter a rehab program and abstain from alcohol, the brain will begin feasting on REM sleep, binging in a desperate effort to recover that which has been long starved of, an effect called the REM sleep rebound. We observe precisely the same consequences caused by excess REM sleep pressure in individuals who have tried to break the sleep deprivation world record before this life-threatening feat was banned. Anyway, you don't have to be using alcohol to levels of abuse, however, to suffer its REM sleep disrupting consequences, as one study can attest. Recall that one function of REM sleep is to aid in memory integration and association the type of information processing required for developing grammatical rules in new language learning or in synthesizing large sets of related facts into an interconnected whole. To wit, researchers recruited a large group of college students for a several-day study. The participants were assigned to one of three experimental conditions. On day one, all the participants learned a novel artificial grammar, rather like learning a new computer coding language or a new form of algebra. It was just the type of memory task that REM sleep is known to promote. Everyone learned the new material to a high degree of proficiency on that first day, around 90% accuracy. Then, a week later, the participants were tested to see how much of that information had been solidified by the six nights of intervening sleep. What distinguished the three groups was the type of sleep they had. In the first group, the control condition, participants were allowed to sleep naturally and fully for all intervening nights. In the second group, the experimenters got the students a little drunk just before bed on the first night after daytime learning. They loaded up the participants with two to three shots of vodka mixed with orange juice, standardizing the specific blood alcohol amount on the basis of gender and body weight. In the third group, they allowed the participants to sleep naturally on the first and even the second night after learning, and then got them similarly drunk before bed on night three. Note that all three groups learned the material on day one while sober and were tested while sober on day seven. This way, any difference in memory among the three groups could not be explained by the direct effects of alcohol on memory formation or later recall, but must be due to the disruption of the memory facilitation that occurred in between. On day seven, participants in the control condition remembered everything they had originally learned, even showing an enhancement of abstraction and retention of knowledge relative to initial levels of learning, just as we'd expect from good sleep. In contrast, those who had their sleep laced with alcohol on the first night after learning suffered what can 
conservatively be described as partial amnesia seven days later, forgetting more than 50% of all that original knowledge. This fits well with evidence we discussed earlier that the brain's non-negotiable requirement for sleep the first night after learning for the purposes of memory processing. The real surprise came in the results of the third group of participants. Despite getting two full nights of natural sleep after initial learning, having their sleep doused with alcohol on the third night still resulted in almost the same degree of amnesia. 40% of the knowledge they had worked so hard to establish on day one was forgotten. The overnight work of REM sleep, which normally assimilates complex memory knowledge, had been interfered with by the alcohol. More surprising, perhaps, was the realization that the brain is not done processing that knowledge after the first night of sleep. Memories remain perilously vulnerable to any disruption of sleep, including that from alcohol, even up to three nights after learning, despite two full nights of natural sleep prior. Framed practically, let's say that you're a student cramming for an exam on Monday. Diligently, you study all the previous Wednesday. Your friends beckon you to come out the night for drinks, but you know how important sleep is, so you decline. On Thursday, friends again, they ask you to grab a few drinks in the evening, but to be safe, you turn them down and sleep soundly a second night. Finally, Friday rolls around, now three nights after your learning session. Everyone's heading out for a party. Surely, after being so dedicated to slumber across the first two nights after learning, you can now cut loose, knowing that those memories have been safely and securely and fully processed within your memory banks. Sadly, not so. Even now, alcohol consumption will wash away much of that which you learned and can abstract by blocking your REM sleep. How long is it before those new memories are finally safe? We actually don't know. However, we have studies underway that may span weeks. What we do know is that sleep has not finished tending to those newly planted memories by night three. I elicit audible groans when I present these findings to my undergrads in lectures. The politically incorrect advice I would, of course, never give is this. Go to the pub for a drink in the morning. That way the alcohol will be out of your system before sleep. Glib advice aside, what is the recommendation when it comes to sleep and alcohol? It's hard not to sound uptight, but the evidence is so strong regarding alcohol's harmful effects on sleep that to do otherwise would be doing you and the science a disservice. Many people enjoy a glass of wine with dinner, even an aperitif thereafter, but it takes your liver and kidneys many hours to degrade and excrete that alcohol, even if you're an individual with that fast acting enzymes for ethanol decomposition. Nightly alcohol will disrupt your sleep, and the annoying advice of abstinence is the best and most honest I can offer. Now, sleep solutions. 12 tips for healthy sleep. Number one, stick to a sleep schedule. Go to bed and wake up at the same time each day. As creatures of habit, people have a hard time adjusting to changes in sleep patterns. Sleeping later on weekends won't fully make up for a lack of sleep during the week and will make it harder to wake up early on Monday morning. Set an alarm for bedtime. Often we set an alarm for when it's time to wake up but fail to do so for when it's time to go to sleep. If there is only one piece of advice you remember and take away from these 12 tips, this should be it. Number two, exercise is great, but not too late in the day. Try to exercise at least 30 minutes on most days, but not later than two or three hours before your bedtime. Number three, avoid caffeine and nicotine. Coffee, colas, certain teas, and chocolate containing the stimulant caffeine and its effects can take as long as eight hours to fully wear off. Therefore, a cup of coffee in the late afternoon can make it hard for you to fall asleep at night. Nicotine is also a stimulant, often causing smokers to sleep only very lightly. In addition, smokers often wake up too early in the morning because of nicotine withdrawal. Number four, avoid alcoholic drinks before bed. Having a nightcap or alcoholic beverage before sleep may help you relax, but heavy use robs you of REM sleep, keeping you in the lighter sleep stages. Heavy alcohol ingestion may also contribute to impairment in breathing at night. You also tend to wake up in the middle of the night when the effects of the alcohol have worn off. Number five, avoid large meals and beverages late at night. A light snack is okay, but a large meal can cause indigestion, which interferes with sleep. Drinking too many fluids at night can cause frequent awakenings to go to the bathroom. Number six, if possible, avoid medicines that delay or disrupt your sleep. 
some commonly prescribed heart, blood pressure, or asthma medications, as well as some over-the-counter and herbal remedies for coughs, colds, or allergies can disrupt sleep patterns. If you have trouble sleeping, talk to your healthcare provider or pharmacist to see whether any drugs you're taking might be contributing to your insomnia and ask whether they can be taken at other times during the day or early in the evening. Number seven, don't take naps after 3 p.m. Naps can help make up for lost sleep, but late afternoon naps can make it harder to fall asleep at night. Number eight, relax before bed. Don't overschedule your day so that no time is left for unwinding. A relaxing activity such as reading or listening to music could be part of your bedtime ritual, as well as gentle stretching or yoga, which is an add-on by me. Number nine, take a hot bath before bed. The drop in body temperature, often getting out of the bath, may help you feel sleepy, and the bath can help you relax and slow down so you're more ready to sleep. Number 10, dark room, cool bedroom, gadget-free bedroom. Get rid of anything in your bedroom that might distract you from sleep, such as noises, bright lights, an uncomfortable bed, or warmer temperatures. You sleep better if the temperature in the room is kept on the cool side. A TV, cell phone, or a computer in the bedroom can be a distraction and deprive you of needed sleep. Having a comfortable mattress and pillow can help promote a good night's sleep. Individuals who have insomnia often watch the clock. Turn the clock's face out of view so you don't worry about the time while trying to fall asleep. Number 11, have the right sunlight exposure. Daylight is key to regulating daily sleep patterns. Try to get outside in natural sunlight for at least 30 minutes each day. If possible, wake up with the sun or use very bright lights in the morning. Sleep experts recommend that if you have problems falling asleep, you should get an hour of exposure to morning sunlight and turn down the lights before bedtime. Again, this is another add-on by me. Speaking of turning the lights down before bedtime, LED lights, all the blue light, we know that's bad. So either, I don't know, use candles or get a pair of blue block uh, sunglasses with like the orange lens that block out the blue rays. And that makes a huge difference as well. Lastly, number 12, don't lie in bed awake. If you find yourself still awake after staying in bed for more than 20 minutes, or if you're starting to feel anxious or worried, get up and do something relaxing until you feel sleepy. The anxiety of not being able to sleep can make it harder to fall asleep. So there you go, guys. A little bit of information from that book. I highly suggest you read it or listen to it. It's awesome. And uh, it's going to blow your mind. And uh, hopefully make you sleep better. So thanks for tuning in.